We are back with the host of the NFL Roadshow, Lindsay Rhodes. Lindsay, how are you doing? I'm so good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. You know, um, there's a lot going on. Football season's right around the corner. Tonight, uh, we've got Woo! a preseason game, Hall of Fame <laughs> game with the Steelers and the Cowboys. Um, but I want to get into the Raider talk first. And recently, you had Raiders general manager Mike Mayock on your podcast. And he said, more than anything, I want to see this if we can be disruptive on defense. And that's going to be one of our goals. Now, yesterday, the Raiders added six-time Pro Bowler Gerald McCoy. What message does this send to Raider fans? Well, I don't know about the message so much, but like, I, I like the signing for a number of reasons. Um, and I know you guys maybe have some crowded, <laughs> uh, you know, interior defensive line rooms happening here. But the thing about Gerald McCoy is he's coming off the injury. He is clearly, you know, on the back end of his career. Mm -hmm. So you don't know what you're going to get. The ceiling, I don't think is what it once was right. as far as his play. But what I do think is you guys have a team. You I'm, I'm including you, you're a member of the Raiders, you know, <laughs> the, the Raiders players, Mike Mayock, John Gruden and right. Kenny King, you guys have a team <laughs> um, that, Gus Bradley is described like as the what is a race to maturity on the defensive yeah. side of the ball. Well, what he brings you is maturity and like the best possible teammate that you could find. He is the kind of guy who will go out of his way to coach up everybody else at his position, all of the younger players. Um, he will offer all of his secrets, all of the things that he's learned over the years, and he is. Uh, obviously a guy who's accomplished a lot at the position and has it all kind of in there. Now, whether he can physically do it himself at this point remains to be seen. If he can, right. then great. So much upside there. Um, at the very worst, he adds depth at the position. But I think actually at the very worst, he adds an ability to just make all of those players who are younger on the defensive side of the ball. He offers them expertise he yeah. offers maybe an extra coach. And I know some people will roll their eyes about the coach on the field type situation. But a few years ago when Mayock drafted Cleveland Farrelly, talked about the character and trying to rebuild the locker room and that kind of stuff. Gerald McCoy is the perfect person to put in a locker room. He is jovial. He is just a guy that everyone likes. Um, I just think he's going to be a really good energy on the team. And I think that the Raiders are at a point where, yes, you need tons of talent. You need people who can actually deliver on the field, but yeah. you also need that, like that little thing that puts you over the edge in terms of maturity and just experience and like a little bit of a veteran presence. And I think he's the perfect one to do that. Cause he won't, he's not that veteran. Who's like really good and is mad. Maybe that he's on the back end or anything like that. He's, yeah. he's, I, I like the signing for a bunch of different reasons. Who knows if it'll play out, you right. know, like in the best way on the field. I hope it will. I'm a big fan yeah. of him personally. Yeah, I think that you, you talking on the the maturity and his jovialness, I think that that plays in really well with the Raiders defense and with some of these leaders, right? Like Max Crosby stepping up and emerging as a leader. Yeah. Um, and Max has been very outspoken uh, about, you know, his recovery, about, you know, how he's how he looks to be a leader, not only of the defense, but of the, of the team. Um, you bring in Yannick Ngakwe, another guy who's, you know, vocal and who's out there to be a leader. Uh, you've got Derek Carr already in that locker room. Uh, and speaking of Derek, I know so in, 19, in 2019, Raider fans got on your case a little bit about uh, the DC for MVP. Um, I helped lead that charge. I, I, I'll take I'll take ownership of that. Um, but you had Derek as a dark horse candidate for MVP. What do you yeah. see from Derek going into year eight and year four with Gruden that sets him apart? Well, it's some of the stuff that I think Mayock talked about on my podcast that that goes unrecognized by some people, there are a lot of people that are out there screaming it from the rooftops because he's a guy that kind of is like one of those middle of the road quarterbacks that people like hate on or then feel the need to come and defend. And I think that he doesn't get enough credit for some of the things that he does do. Uh, in my personal opinion, some of the criticism is warranted, but I also think that, that he hasn't had historically, you know, in years past, he hasn't always had the best situation around him to succeed. Yeah. And I think, and I've said this before, 
that I think he's the type of quarterback who needs a situation to be a certain way in order to be his best self. There are certain quarterbacks out there like a Patrick Mahomes or whatever that don't come along very often who can make up for a ton of different deficiencies, right? Because they either have the physicality to move around by themselves. Sometimes I'm like literally in my head going, David, Derek, David, Derek, David, which one's right. I always do this. Um, (laughs) Derek, I think is the type of quarterback who can be perfect for an offense. So long as the offensive line does their job capably. So long as the right wide receivers You know, you have someone who can stretch the field, who's going to be in the spot. Like, I think he's more of like a timing and some of that kind of stuff. He needs it to be on time. He needs everybody else to be perfect. And so, and I think that that's fine and that's fair. You know, not every quarterback is going to be that guy who can do everything and be everything. And so I don't think that that's a, I mean, obviously it's not a strength, but I I don't think it's the worst thing in the world either. And I do think that the Raiders have made moves in the last couple of years to put some more pieces around him and put him in a better situation to succeed. And I think that you've seen like that year where he was, you know, in the MVP conversation for a minute, um, there, there were some of those elements in play. And I, I, uh, the reason that you come up with him as a, as a dark horse MVP candidate, I think when I did was, that it's like, so if the Raiders are a team that's on the cusp, right? When you have yeah. a team that looks like they weren't that good the year before, and then all of a sudden, if they go to the playoffs or whatever, well, then the quarterback is going to be in the MVP conversation, unless right. he's clearly not the reason that they're doing that. Like in Tennessee, you could look and go, okay, well, why, you know, Tannehill, but you, you look at that offense and you go, okay, Derek Henry and AJ, like there are other components there that get more attention than the quarterback. Mm -hmm. And you could argue about whether or not that's right or wrong. But, uh, so if the Raiders turn out to be amazing, then it will shock everybody. And the quarterback will always get a lot of credit for that. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you know, everybody says the league's always better when the Raiders are good. When the Raiders are winning, the league is always better. The, when the Raiders are doing good things and they're, they're being talked about on, you know, on national television, that's where it's exciting. And I think that every year, especially the past two years, we've gotten the Raiders have had these midseason collapses that, you know, it's like we talk about by week 10, it's like, are the Raiders a playoff team? Are the Raiders for real? And then all of a sudden there's this slide. Yeah. I know that Mike Mayock talked about that. What are some things that the Raiders need to focus on this year to not have that slide this year? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know that I know the answer to that so much as I, what I do think is I think that the Raiders in the last couple of years, when they have played well, like that game against the chiefs, they were not, they were not a better team than the chiefs in my opinion last year, right? Like they just, they, they put it all together and they like, And I think that's what you need with a team that just isn't built. Like where you look at the roster and you go, what this team's going on a Super Bowl run. Like you need teams that are in the process of being built to play better than they look on paper. And I do think that the Raiders, and I think that this is actually a good thing that in some of those instances, they played better than they actually were, you know, in terms of the talent. And I think that that's hard to maintain. You know, when you talk about, regression and you hear this all the time in analytics right there's going to be a defensive regression or this player player had so many touchdowns that's way above the norm and so there's going to be a regression I think that's maybe what you see with the Raiders at the end of the season is Mm -hmm. that some of those teams that do have just like the talent and the roster and all that kind of stuff once you start getting that many games no that many reps under your belt like it all kind of comes together for them and it's just harder for the Raiders to maybe keep up if you've been playing above your head or outside yourself for so long that's hard to maintain um I'm sure there are other components in play too but I just I think I haven't looked at the Raiders roster for the last couple of years and said that is a Super Bowl contender you know And so I think a lot of us that want the Raiders to be great, you kind of go into every matchup and you're like, okay, we can, we can, but it's not like we should, we should, we should. (laughs) Right. And so I think they're building in such a way that they think that they will get to that point. And I think that they've made some good moves. The big question, the big, 
the big head scratcher this off season was the way that they dismantled the offensive line for me. Yeah. Right. Like, because yeah. I, and the thing that I said at the time was like, you're, you're building and it's, it's slow. I understand that it's kind of hard from free agency and the draft and whatever, you can't put all these pieces in place all at once. So you go, you kind of like chip away at it. Right. And then you go, okay, we've got our offensive line. Offensive line is a strength. This is a strength. That's a strength. Now we just need to fill a hole here and a full fill a hole here. And we need to, and that's how you build the team. Well, um, I thought that Mike was really, really interesting on my podcast, breaking down all of the reasons that he did that on the offensive line and that he um, thinks it's better, particularly where the O-line is concerned to maybe make a move a little bit too early rather than a little bit too late. And financially, he broke down uh, what all of the different players that they moved on from, what that meant financially, where they were at the stage of their career, ages, injuries, the person they had behind them, the financial difference there, as opposed to the uh, play on the field difference. And I thought he made a really strong argument for why that was the right move, or at the very least, why it was a reasonable move. You know, it was reasonable for him to think that that was the right move and in the long-term best interest, excuse me, of the Raiders. And, um, I'm very curious to see how that move plays out because, yeah, um, you know, and he even acknowledged, he's like, it, they might not look that great in the first couple of games, which is something that's hard. To, you, it's, you know, you can't just like that's a, that's sacrifice a, hard a couple of swallow. games. Yeah. Right. But but I don't know. I mean, what if if it was in the best long term interest of the Raiders, considering, and this is the thing that Mike Mayock can't say right now, and and probably doesn't think. But I'm when I'm listening to him, I'm like, you guys are not. I don't think you're there yet. I don't think. I still don't look at the roster and go, that is a team. I think the Raiders are a team that is going to win a lot of games this year maybe take a couple that other people don't think that they should. I think they could be on the cusp, but I don't think I look at this roster right now and say they should go all the way. And so I think when you're looking at, at being at that point in your development, then that is the smart time to say like, let's get these guys some reps so that then maybe next year we add a couple more pieces. Maybe now we look at the roster and go, shit, we're going to do some stuff. And then yeah. now they have those reps under their belt and they're a little bit more ready for that run. Yeah, it's very interesting because, you know, if if it works out, then it works out. And if it doesn't work out, then yeah. Raider fans are going to, they're going to go crazy about it. Um, the Raiders were a team that last year were probably one of the worst in dealing with COVID. You know, we had an offensive line out for a week. We had a, the whole defense out for a week. Uh, we had John Gruden on the sidelines with the weirdest mask that I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> and so this year they're they're doing really well with vaccinations. Um, and it's interesting because you had Tom Pelissero on your pod yesterday. Uh, he was talking about the COVID vaccinations. And an interesting connection was the teams that have their leaders vaccinated or the teams that have the higher vaccination numbers. Um, what do you, th- now I know the league's taken a hard stance on that this year. What do you see? How can these, di- how can these discrepancies affect the season? Um, I, well, I think, I think it could affect the season because there are clear competitive <laughs> advantages built in based yeah. on the way that the league has chosen to approach this whole situation where you know, you're allowed to have a meeting without masks. You're allowed to meet in person. You're allowed to do a lot more things. You're allowed to travel together. You know, just like little things are going to make the season much harder for players and staff members who are unvaccinated. And I think that there's, there's no doubt that the season's hard enough as it is. So as much as you can make things easier and not harder, then that's going to help you out. Plus, And I know that they're talking about changing this rule. The players association is asking for players who are vaccinated to still have to be tested more frequently. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that was built in. That was almost an incentive for players to get vaccinated uh, that Tom talked about in the podcast is that players who are vaccinated as of right this second only have to be tested every like two weeks. Whereas players who are unvaccinated have to get tested every single day. Well, that's one way that you might say like you should get vaccinated because that's a pain in the ass. So, but one of the things that Tom brought up that I think is a good point is that you also have people around the league going, 
But everything we're hearing from the CDC is that this Delta variant is just as transmissible, um, you know, by pl- people who are vaccinated too. It's not, maybe not as transmissible, but it's still, it's being transmitted. There's so chance, yeah. if you have the Delta variant and you can still pass it along and uh, there are still benefits to being vaccinated, you might not get as sick or whatever, but then you could be out on a practice field for two weeks, passing it along to everyone else on the team. That's yeah. clearly not what we're going for. So they might change those rules, but, <clears throat> but I think that it just based on testing is going to lead to an availability issue, right? Yeah. Like, cause the odds of you coming up positive are going to be greater. If you're in a team environment, if you're the person who's getting tested every day. And then right. like we saw with the Vikings quarterback situation, if you have three guys who are unvaccinated, one of them tests positive, the other two have to be lifted out because of the way that the COVID protocols go. So now if that had been in season, then you'd be missing Kirk Cousins and Kellen Mond and the third string quarterback. And now all of a sudden you've got Browning, who's like your fourth string guy that it's exactly what we saw with the Broncos last year when they had to right. play a wide receiver at quarterback. So I think um, I, I, that obviously would be a competitive disadvantage for the Vikings, right? So yeah. I, what I thought was interesting about that in the conversation with Tom is like, so that, that I think is an anomaly. I don't think you're going to have three quarterbacks, for instance, on every team who are all unvaccinated. Right. But if you did, then I'm cutting that third string quarterback if I'm the coach, because I need a guy there who just pure protocol standpoint will be available if something happens. Um, and so I think, and that's one of the ways in which I think we will see this play out that Tom also mentioned, you're not going to have practice squad guys who are unvaccinated because the practice squad is all about availability. And so if there's a stronger chance that you won't be available just because of the protocols that are in place for unvaccinated players, then there's no motivation for the team to have you be the guy that is standing by to stand by, you know? Yeah. So I think we'll see it with the bubble cuts and they won't acknowledge that some of the players are cut because they're unvaccinated, but I think a hundred percent that's the way it'll go down. And uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Cause you've got like the bills, right? Like, I mean, I don't know exactly where they stand there and I certainly don't want to speak to it, but I mean, Cole Beasley, (laughs) Cole Beasley has been very outspoken, right? You know, I don't know if Josh Allen is vaccinated at this point or not. He's, vocally kind of in the past acknowledged that he was a little bit hesitant and he wasn't sure and whatever. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's changed or not, but you know, you could have a team. That's a team that I I expect to compete for it all this year. So are we going to take them out of play? If, if something happens and the right people are, are just, you know, lifted out because someone tests positive, they going to have to forfeit games. I would be, that's the most interesting yeah, that's Damn. the most interesting to me is that that forfeiture of games. If it's an unvaccinated player and they for and I, I know the players are up in arms about it, but that's the yeah. one that that really stands out to me. That if it's an unvaccinated player and we look at the bubble cuts, like Raiders have Jalen Jalen Richard, who's been very outspoken against vaccinations, and then ended up on the COVID list. Uh, you have Theo Riddick, who just recently retired because he came down with COVID and he looked at his health. Um, and so those are the things that kind of stand out to me. So that, that's kind of what I've got my eyes on. Um, yeah. And this season, it's, it's weird. I mean, we're getting back to, to fans in the stadiums. Uh, I was recently at Allegiant for the, for the gold cup. And it was great to just be around fans, even though they, they weren't chanting Raiders. It was weird, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wait, we're in Raider stadium. There's fights. But nobody's yelling Raiders. It's, what the heck? It's going perfect. On? It's just like being home, but everyone's <laughs> yeah. not wearing black. That's weird. Yeah, everybody had green and stuff on. I was like, hey, at least nobody's wearing <laughs> red. I'm good. As long as nobody's wearing red or powder blue or or blue and orange, I'm good. But it was interesting. Um, but but pivoting from that, um, one thing I wanted to talk to you about is is the rise in women in sports, uh, and we're seeing a, a significant rise in women in sports and in analyst roles and in executive roles, which is awesome to me. Um, what do you think is leading that charge? Um, I think in large part, it's it's well, it's just a number of years of people putting in the work 
and getting to the point where it's not abnormal to have a yeah. female in certain roles. You know, like when I first started, when I first went into sports broadcasting, there were far fewer females um, behind the scenes, in front of the camera, all of it. And now I think we've gotten to a point where they're just, you know, you see it, it starts with someone being able to see someone and going, mm -hmm. oh, that's an available path to me, right? If you could see it, you can be it, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And like, for me, that was Hannah Storm. Hannah Storm sitting on the, on the desk for NBA on NBC and like controlling the conversation and being a badass. And like, I was like, I like that. Like that appeals to me. Yeah. Specifically wasn't being on TV. It was being that type of person on TV. Like where it was like smart and, you know, it was clearly not about, uh, like you could tell that no one was giving her the words or anything like that, like yeah. credibility and authority. And like, I am up here doing something that you don't think I can do. And all of that appealed to me. So then that becomes my example of seeing someone do something and then going, I'm going to go down that road too. And then, you know, more and more people do that. It, it just, becomes that there's a lot more women that are in the industry. And the more that you see women in the industry, like at the beginning of my career, I got a lot more feedback back then. It was like message boards or whatever, as opposed to social media. Thank God there wasn't social media. Oh, I've seen, man. I've recently been watching some of my early tapes for a project that I'm doing and holy moly, was I awful. <laughs> so I'm so glad that there was no Twitter for me to get that feedback on a regular basis because I <laughs> probably would not have continued in the industry. But, um, but I think um, when it, it I, I would get feedback at the time where I would hear, like, it was a lot more like people were like, what do you know? You didn't play and all that kind of stuff. And now I think people are so used to females being a part of that conversation in sports that that's just not something you've had people grow up where that's the norm. And so that's right. just not the way that they think. And so now that we're there, it becomes like, well, tell us what you think too. And also that's part of just the industry changing because when mm -hmm. I got in, it was very like big J journalism, just across the board in everything. You are not the story. We don't care what you think you're there to ask someone who is there for a purpose, like the expert, you're the per person whose job it is to ask the expert what they think. Nobody like, you know, and that made sense at the time. I'm like a 25 year old chick who didn't play football. Like, what am I going to tell you? Like, you're not tuning in to hear my opinion. You're tuning in to hear, you know, LaDainian Tomlinson's opinion or whatever. Yeah. And I think as time has gone on and personally for me, I found myself in tons of meetings with former athletes or, you know, the producers or whatever. And you just get to a point where you're like, no, I actually feel pretty confident that I have a grasp on what's going on and that I can be a part of this conversation. And there's no reason for me to mute myself. Like I do have something yeah. to bring to the table. I have some valid opinions. So I'm going to start saying what those are. And I think that the industry is changing where people are looking for people on TV who bring something to the table that aren't just traffic cops. Um, you know, your old school host that just asks questions. I think that's kind of going by the wayside and now everyone yeah. needs to bring some value to the table. Um, somebody like Amina Kimes, um, mm. the fact that the path has opened up for her to be an analyst and she brings so much to the table because she just looks at it differently. You know, she'll have yeah. like, and it's not just opinion, it's data driven. You know, she'll look at like the analytics and she'll watch tape and she'll bring stuff to the table that's super valid. And I think that we're just kind of getting to a point where we're all ready for that. Yeah, I think that that's huge. And, you know, you look at like your colleague, your former colleagues at the NFL Network and, you know, the, the interactions that are that are there. Um, it, it's really exciting to see that and just the diversity. And I, I talked with Steve Weich about this and the diversity and inclusion and how we're seeing more diversity. We're seeing more women. We're seeing more people of color in, in these roles that we didn't typically see before. How can we continue to create more diversity and inclusion and how can we create a, a more diverse culture? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with people being in the rooms where decisions are being made yes. because they're throughout the course of my career. And even now, you know, there's a lot of it that's performative and you see that it's performative, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. um, as a woman, I have recognized again, over the course of my career, sometimes being like feeling like that role was cast 
where, whereas everybody else on the show was like, picked based on their experience and stuff like that. Like when I first got in, I noticed a lot of, okay, so the, the, the male is somebody with tons of experience and has worked very hard and it's obvious and they're polished and they're ready for the role. And then there's an analyst and then there's whatever. And then there is a female. And sometimes the female has not done anything before on camera. I mean, I remember there being times when I worked for companies that would like look for hosts men who had done the job in various markets and had all this experience. And then they'd go like bring in models from CAA and those people would read for the newsreader role or something like that. And you're like, why is that treated so differently? Don't they understand that there are also women who are doing all of the things that the men are doing to build their career and be ready for a hosting role that are doing yeah. small market work that are doing, you know, print journalism and then transferring over. And, and I, I feel like that was because the people in the rooms that were making those decisions just had no idea, you know, like yeah. it just wasn't where they were. So, um, I think the more you have people who have been there and done that, who, who represent that group that are in a room that can say like, maybe we shouldn't, um, require the woman to wear short tight dresses. Maybe that's just a small little note, you know, maybe that sends the wrong message. Yeah. Maybe it also brings in the wrong people, you know, like I don't, if you want the woman to have a conversation where they bring something to the table, then you need to have that be part of the process where you're looking for that, you know? Yeah. So, cause otherwise it's a setup to fail situation. If you're looking for someone to come on your show and be hot and you're not actually testing out whether they can take part in the conversation, um, capably, then you're potentially putting someone in the conversation who can't do that. Right. And, and then that's not fair to them. It's not fair to the way that it looks in a larger picture. So anyway, I just think a lot of it has to do a lot of the, the issues, um, with regard to like tokenism and cause sometimes it has been tokenism yeah. and that's just the truth is because they're not necessarily looking for the right versions of minorities. You know what I mean? And they're mm -hmm. out there, but it's the people who are like, Oh, we need a woman. Oh, we need a minority. And they're like, yeah. anyone will do. And that's the thing I've always found to be part of the most offensive thing. Like we're not all the same. Like what, right. you know, like go find somebody, like, let it be a meritocracy, just like it is for all of the white men. So mm -hmm. I do think that we're seeing some change at the top of the food chain. And I think that that is starting to trickle down and to turn and, and people are crushing it. Right. Yeah. Like you've just got people that are getting these opportunities who are just kicking ass. Like Maria Taylor is so freaking yeah. good at what she does. So that incredibly versatile too i mean she yeah. she can do everything across the board um so it's exciting to see exciting to see that but yeah i think that's the big and we see it with we see it with coaching roles as well like don't hire a black head coach just to say hey we hired a black head coach like yeah. hire a guy based off his based off his merit um and you know speaking of that going into the black coaches we've got a black coach tonight with mike tomlin with the pittsburgh steelers um it's hall of fame weekend First of all, who are you most excited to see in Shrine tonight or this weekend? Um, this is such a weird weekend, right? Because the whole yeah. 2020 and yeah, whatever. Yeah, we got two classes. Um, I mean, Peyton. Peyton Manning was probably my favorite player, you know, at, at a certain point in my career. Like when I was just falling in love with the NFL, I think Peyton Manning was the quarterback that I identified with most, um, because, uh, there, are, uh, again, I talked about like the Patrick Mahomes is who have all the physical talent and just, mm -hmm. he never seemed like that. And clearly there is physical talent involved with what he's doing, but it felt yeah. like the thing that put him over the edge was that he just worked so freaking hard and that he was so smart. And I always found that my personality, that's who I was in broadcasting. Not that I was so freaking smart, but I'm just saying like, <laughs> I knew like I was never going to be the funniest or wittiest or like I can be those things. But if we're having a competition where we're looking for someone who's just straight funny and witty, I'm not going to win that one. Mm -hmm. So what 
the way I could make myself an asset was just, I will outwork everybody. I will read everything that's out there. I will consume all the information, have an ability to edit it down. I will do all of the reps. I will say yes to everything. And I'll get to the point where I just, I can do it, but it's through work. And, you know, I can use my brain to kind of like make myself an asset. And I, so in that sense, I always felt like he was relatable. He was the relatable quarterback of the star quarterbacks. Um, because he did it the way that I thought if I was a quarterback, like I would have to do it too, in order yeah. to make myself a valuable asset. But, uh, so Peyton, God, he's also so funny when he he's wants hilarious. to be, you know, yeah. like there's just, so I think that his speech will be awesome. Um, I'm interested to see Charles Woodson. Um, and I know that you're excited about that one as well. Oh yeah. Well, it's exciting. Cause Charles, so Charles and Peyton came in in the same year. Yeah. And it, the crazy thing is that their whole career that they played together, Charles had never intercepted Peyton Manning. <laughs> and then finally, in Charles's last year, he intercepted he intercepted Peyton Manning twice in one game. It, Do you think so, they'll, he'll bring that up? I hope so. I think he for sure. I will. hope so. I hope so. Yeah. I you know I think that there's there's a couple guys that Charles has been tied with his whole career, right? Peyton's one. Tom Brady is unfortunately another one. Yeah. Uh, but. I'm really excited about Charles. I'm excited about Coach Flores. Um, you know, my dad played for Flores, won two Super Bowls with him. Uh, and so it's going to be really exciting to, to go there and, and celebrate somebody that that I've grown up around. You know, I grew up in that locker room. And and to be, you know, to see him and to see all the, the former players and to see him get in while he's still alive. I think that's the biggest thing. A lot of Raiders, uh, especially Kenny Stabler, weren't able to see themselves go in and, and to give that speech. And so, you know, Raider fans, we're excited about that. Um, it's, but it's, I'm so, it's, I'm yeah. so jealous that you're going to have this experience before I do. Cause I've never been to Canton. I'm dying to go to Canton. I've never been yeah. there hall of fame weekend. I've missed out on all of it. And it's special when you, when you do have a tie to somebody who's going in, like you do, like the years that, you know, when LT and Kurt Warner went in, yeah. I was like, I'm sitting at home on my couch, just crying, you know, like when TD I'm, Oh my gosh, like what? So there for me, I love the weekend and I've been able to see up close and personal with those guys having worked with them and, and having been there when they have heard no, like when yeah. Kurt Warner didn't get in, you know, like how, how much they really care. And so that when they do get the call for the people who do have to wait, how much it actually means to them TD when TD made it. So it used to be that they would announce it so they would announce it at honors right yeah that's roughly like that day is when they would find out whether they had made it or not and i remember sitting in the audience at honors and knowing that in past years what happened (sighs) is that when they when the the people who got no's were people who at some point in the middle of the ceremony the doors would open and they'd kind of filter into the audience and then the people who had gotten the call they were backstage getting ready to walk out. So I had seen it before where the door would open and Kurt Warner would walk in and he'd take his seat and I'd go, oh, Kurt didn't make it. So the year that TD made it, um, and I was very emotionally invested in him making it because I knew how much yeah. it meant to him. The doors opened and TD walked in with his wife and took a seat and I started crying and his wife looks at me and goes, are you okay? And I'm like, <laughs> the way she said it threw me off. Cause I was like, well, obviously I'm not like, you're here. What's going on. But like, she said it, like she was so fine. And so I was like, yeah. no, I'm yeah. Fine. What? Huh? Fine. <laughs> totally fine. And then he made it and they, they actually walked up from the audience that, uh, that particular year, but That's yeah, amazing. there's just, there's so much emotional investment. It's just such a special time for those guys. Oh, yeah. So I love that you're getting a chance to experience it. Yeah, and sorry about the technical difficulties. My camera was going off and on here. He did a great job of uh, of holding on, though. Good I'm job. like, am I alone? Are you here? <laughs> am I talking and not there's? It's not being recorded, no, which is I'm fine. Here. I'll talk to myself. <laughs> I, I've done that before. I was doing a podcast <laughs> with Cody. I was doing a podcast with Cody when we first started out, and uh, I'm sitting there talking, and he had just dropped off, and <laughs> he called he called me like ten minutes later. He's like. Hey, uh, what are you doing? It's like, I was talking. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. Well, everybody's had that happen on the phone. Oh, yeah. We were like, oh, how yeah. long was I talking? Yeah, before exactly. Before I lost you. 
Yeah. But, uh, you know, kind of finishing that off, what going into season, what are you most excited for this NFL season? I mean, obviously football, but yeah, right. what is, what is the, what are you most excited about? Um, I think I'm most excited for some of the teams that like, I just don't know. Yeah. You know, like, I think that there are some teams out there that it's just hard to predict. Um, and I'm interested to see like what they actually are. Like the teams that are good are fun to watch, obviously, but like, I expect the chiefs, sorry, to come out and look good. I expect the bucks to look good, but I think what will be fun is those teams that feel like they're kind of on the bubble. And and by the way, I should also mention, I feel like there are also a handful of teams where you're like, I am confident they're not going to be good. So I know where to put the good, the really good teams. I know where to put the really bad teams, Mm -hmm. but then there's some in the middle that you're like, I don't know, are they going to be competitive or are they going to, you know, fall on the other side of things? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a handful of teams that fall into that category. And I just, I'm curious to get my first look at them so that I can understand like whether or not they're going to be like the Ravens or one where I'm not a hundred percent sure because they were so good two years ago. And then they were like, eh, last year. And I, I just want to see whether or not they've been able to figure out why they were eh and put them back over the top. Because I think they are one of those teams that has the talent to be very good if it all comes together Mm -hmm. um the patriots made so many off-season moves after such a bad year but they have belichick and you kind of have this feeling like they know what they're doing so are they going to be competitive again and i'm i'm curious about that yeah uh the falcons are another team the saints like what are the saints doing because i talked to sean payton for my podcast a couple weeks ago i did not get the feeling that he was like trying to sandbag, like he was, he was gassing them up to a degree. Like he wasn't going crazy, but he was like, I know people have questions. I think we're going to be very good. And I'm excited about it. And I was like, that's an interesting approach to take. If you're him, I might play it down and let us surprise people if we're good. You know, I felt like he was not lowering expectations, which I think is somewhat interesting. Now they've had some things happen to them since then with regard to Mike Thomas and Mm -hmm. they have some issues, but you know, the Panthers, the Broncos, the Cardinals, um, the Giants, the Vikings, the Vikings are a team that I think like everyone's sort of expecting to be very middle of the road, but I I think they have the potential to be that they have the potential to be, eh, or they have the potential to be pretty stinking good because that offense was good last year. As long as you've got Dalvin cook and Adam Thielen and Justin Jefferson. And I know no one's really excited about Kirk cousins, but sort of similar to like what we talked about with, with Carr earlier, like you don't have, he doesn't have to be everything if all the weapons are around him. And so if that defense is a lot better than it was last year, and I think they have the potential to be a lot better than they were last year, then all of a sudden that's a team that's super competitive that we could be talking about a playoff run with. I think that's what I'm most excited about is the question marks. I think the, the, the big question mark too, is the Packers this year and Aaron Rodgers. Do coming you in think for the they're last a question dance. mark? Well, I think I, they're going to like run. The, I, I think they're going to run it. They're like, I think they it. are. They're going far. I, I think that, but I think that's the question mark. It's like, what happens after this year? Because oh, you have yeah. Aaron Rodgers and Devontae posting the posting the last dance picture, and then you know Aaron Rodgers his holdout, and you know the all the rumors that come out, and the Jerry Cross comments, and this is because you want Devontae. I do want Devontae. Right? Of course I want Derek wants Devontae. Of course Derek's he does. Willing, Derek's willing to buy You're a like, car Let's for fast forward to next spring where we find out that we're getting Devontae. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, uh, it's like the, the joke, we have Devontae at home. We've got Brian Edwards and Derek mm. has likened him to Devontae. But when you have the, if you have a chance to get Devontae, you get Devontae, oh, yeah. you go after him. But yeah, of I course mean, I want Devontae. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yes, I agree with you that next offseason is going to be very interesting. I think Aaron's gone. Wild. I think that's, I don't even think that's a question. I think, I mean, I suppose something could change this year, but I think something would have to change. I think the plan is right now for Aaron to be gone. And my expectation is yeah. that Aaron will uh, will leave the Packers next offseason, that they'll trade him, that he'll have some control over where he is traded. And I think they have to move on to Jordan Love. Otherwise, there was no point in ever making the draft pick right? Like you took him too early. 
you are tied to him. You made the choice back then that Jordan Love is your next quarterback or else you're not taking him that high. You're not drafting a backup yeah. in the first round, you know? So, and you have to get him on the field before you have to make the decision whether or not to invest in him and yeah. pick up the option and give him a long-term deal. Like they need to see him on the field and that has to happen next year. So it's such a Packer move, <laughs> you know, draft, draft a guy in the first round when you've got a hall of fame veteran sitting right there. Right. So. Who, by the way, and I was just having this conversation with my husband at dinner last night. Like I get why Aaron's so frustrated, yeah. you know, like, and I know he has said a million times, it's not about the draft. Right. But I think the draft's a component. The draft is like a oh, symptom yeah. of a larger issue that he has problems with in that we're right there. I can get you to the Super Bowl. Just give me a couple more pieces, you know, give me like one more wide receiver. So I've got Devonte and I've got a really strong two or get me like a, and Tunyon's been great, but like, give me like a, you know, Kelsey, like whatever depth on the O-line would have been great in the playoffs last yeah. year, or get me like just a ball hawk. Give me something amazing on defense, like something just to put us over the top because I've only got a few years left and I can get you that Super Bowl. Help me help you. And then they go draft his replacement so early. Something isn't going to help at all. And then I love AJ Dillon. I love AJ Dillon, but mm -hmm. AJ Dillon falls into the same category. If you're Aaron Rodgers, you're like, well, that's great, but we have Jamal Williams and we have Aaron Jones. We don't even need AJ Dillon this right. year. And they didn't, they didn't use him except for like one game. And then they put him back on the shelf. So you're like, just let's go for it. Like, don't always th be thinking about, the long term figure that out kind of like later don't waste my time so yeah. it would be very very interesting well Lindsay, i really appreciate you coming on uh it was it was a great great conversation sorry for the technical difficulties but we were able to work through it um where can where can people find you what are you what are you doing now so the podcast is yeah. available wherever you get podcasts the nfl road show um, as you mentioned, my most recent episode was with Tom Pellicero. We did a deep dive on all of the NFL COVID vaccination stuff. And again, I realize some people hear that and they kind of roll their eyes and they're like, I'm done with those conversations. We didn't yeah. have like a, here's what you should do. And here's what the facts are and all that kind of stuff. We literally just talked about what is actually happening with regard to the NFL's approach to it this year. Like everyone's heard about the bracelets, the differently colored bracelets that are going to, you know, separate vaccinated and unvaccinated. And um, I wanted to clarify some of the stuff about that. Like what's actually happening? What's not happening? Are we going to know during the season who's vaccinated and unvaccinated? You know, if you're yeah. trying to draft a fantasy squad, for instance, like Huge. there's a lot of like, I don't know. Do you go get a cool Beasley or do you leave them there? Because they might, like what's actually happening with regard to the league's approach to this and who is going to be available for me during the season. So yeah. I, I wanted to get some of those questions out of the way, just so that I could wrap my brain around what was really going to go down. And I think that there are probably a lot of people at home that are in the same position. So those are the types of things we talked about. And that is available to be downloaded anywhere you get your podcast. And then I'm also just doing a fantasy show on Sirius XM um fantasy sports radio a couple awesome. times a week so you can find me there awesome make sure you guys go and subscribe to Lindsay's podcast it's it's amazing i listen to every episode it's one of my favorite pod i don't listen to a lot of pods but Lindsay, i do listen to yours and You're when you best. do listen if you go on apple pods make sure you drop five stars and if you're Ooh. feeling froggy please please leave a review that's how she gets that's how she gets her feedback you know Yay. we talk about this all the time on my pod so Make sure you go subscribe. Make sure you give, give her Lindsay a follow. She's a great follow on Twitter. And uh, Lindsay, it was great talking to you. You too, Kenny. Thanks for doing that. That's the part that I think feels gross. Right? Yeah. Like about the podcast. Like, okay, and now yeah. I'm going to sound needy. Please leave a review and, you know, give me some stars and all that kind of stuff. And so I never do it because it just feels dirty. So thanks for doing it for me. Hey, I'm like TLC. I ain't too proud to beg. <laughs> You're the best. All right, Lindsay, thank you.